Good evening. This is a map of central Oxford. Standing in the middle of High Street, facing west, this is what one would see. This is Oxford High Street, seen from my camera a couple of days ago. This is Oxford High Street, 200 years ago, as seen through Joseph Mallard William Turner's eyes. This painting was acquired by the Ashmolean Museum in 2015 and now hangs upstairs. Turner left other views of Oxford, for example, this view of the Tur. However, Turner's High Street is the only full-size townscape in oils, which makes it of special interest to the historian of art. But to me, this painting is also significant for the history of medicine. Let's compare the two views, mine and Turner's. Apart from the slant of the camera, as you can see the buildings in my pictures are slanted, and the tarmac and the telephone booth, all the architecture seems to be there. All Souls on the right, University College on the left, the Carfax Tower at the back, so everything is there, or is it? If we look closely, there is something missing in today's high street, something that appears in Turner's painting, but not in my photograph. Here on the left. The photograph shows a gap between these two buildings, whereas Turner's painting shows in its place a house with a front portal, and a small crowd gathered in front of it. This is a higher magnification of the house that appears in Turner's painting with a crowd in front of it. And the way it looks today, nothing in between. The gap is best seen from the side in the space between the two buildings, now partially occupied by the Shelley Memorial Something else stood. The missing building was called Deep Hall and was the at the time property of Christchurch College. Today, a plaque identifies the site as being the house in which, between 1655 and 1668, lived Robert Boyle, who discovered Boyle's Law, and made experiments with an air pump designed by his assistant, Robert Hooke, inventor, scientist, and architect. He made the microscope and first identified the living cell, so Robert Hooke discovered the cell. Robert Boyle was a leading intellectual figure in the 17th century and one of the founders of modern chemistry. He, um, he worked on gases and uh, discovered what is now known as uh, Boyle's Law which just mean that if you compress the gas, it will take less space. At the time when the notion of discovering something was typically thought of in terms of logical argumentation, so you discovered something by arguing things out, Boyle champ championed discovery through observation of nature and experimentation. Boyle was one of the co-founders of the Royal Society in 1660. The Royal Society is a group of people who met to discuss empirical methods and results from scientific experiments. At about that time, he moved to Oxford and uh, took up residence at 88 High Street, which is the site of Deep Hall, in the back of, the, uh, of an apothecary um, uh, of a shop owned by a certain doctor, John Cross, who was both an apothecary and um, an hotelier. So he was both um, his landlord and the apothecary. In Oxford, Boyle met Robert Hooke, who had finished his doctorate at Christchurch and engaged him as an assistant. Working together at Deep Hall, Boyle and Hooke devised the vacuum chamber, 
also known as the air pump, which you might have seen in this later painting that hangs at the National Gallery. This is an artist's view of how the interior of Deep Hall would have looked like in Boyle's time. It shows Hook fitting a glass globe onto his air pump while Boyle supervises. The experiment is taking place at the rear of the apothecary shop, which appears here in the back of the left, and probably this person could be the landlord. This kind of experiments are thought to have taken place between 1669 and 1671. And all this is memorialized in this plaque. However, in that same space, so here, another key event unfolded, of which the plaque makes no mention. In 1656, Robert Boyle teamed up with Christopher Wren, which is there also, so the architect, and with a dog, which also is there, to change the course of medicine. Together they provided the earliest known proof of principle for intravenous anesthesia. Let us deconstruct this term, intravenous anesthesia. Anesthesia means literally a privation of sensation, anesthesis, without sensation. By depriving of sensation, anesthesia makes it possible to perform painful procedures, for example surgery, without the patient feeling pain. Anesthesia is achieved through the use of drugs, anesthetics, which have the property of inducing a temporary and reversible abolition of sensation or of consciousness. The anesthetic effect can be achieved by various routes, for example by inhaling the anesthetic or by injecting in the anesthetic. So intravenous anesthesia is the injection of an anesthetic into the bloodstream. The concept of injecting substances into the body dates back to antiquity, and its adoption as a medical aid is recorded since at least the 15th century. In his treatise on surgery, published in 1497, Alsatian alchemist and surgeon Hieronymus Brunschwig showed a piston syringe as a surgical tool. French barber surgeon Ambroise Paré, who served as a royal surgeon for a number of French kings and then for 30 years worked in the army developing uh, treatments for wounds, war wounds, mentioned the syringe as a common surgical tool. However, the breakthrough came in 1628 when William Harvey first discovered and described the circulation of blood. So this is a key event, because up to that point, the syringe was thought to um, induce a local effect, localized at the point of injection. But William Harvey discovered that the blood circulates. And so uh, this is the way he discovered it, by pressing on a vein and observing that only one side of the vein will swell. And the key sentence in his treatise is here where he concludes that it is necessary to conclude that the blood in animals is driven in a circular motion and that it moves perpetually and that this is the function of the heart which it performs by pulsating. So therefore he makes a connection between the pulsating of the heart and the circular motion of the blood. Back a deep hole, Christopher Wren, who by the way is known for being an architect, but he was also a professor of astronomy and he doubled in medicine. So Christopher Wren understood that blood circulation could be used to carry liquid medicine to a different part of the body, thus giving rise to a revolutionary idea of injecting medicine to achieve a systemic effect, so a general effect rather than simply a local effect localized to the site of injection. Because at that point, it was known that 
one could inject something in one part of the body and the blood by circulating will deliver the medication throughout. So in 1656, Wren and Boyle put the idea to the test and injected a mixture of opium and alcohol into a vein of a dog. Not that particular dog. <coughs> opium had long been used to numb the senses. Seeds of the opium poppy have been found in prehistoric dwellings and opium was praised by the Persian philosopher and physician Avicenna as the most powerful of stupor-producing substances. Swiss alchemist and surgeon Paracelsus is credited with discovering that the derivative of opium, laudanum, was a painkiller. Laudanum, however, remained largely unknown until 1676 when English physician Thomas Sydenham published his medical observation concerning the history and cure of acute diseases in which he advocates the use of laudanum for a range of medical conditions including fever, dysentery, um, smallpox, um, colics, etc., etc. As an aside, Sidenham writes in Latin, and uh, it is very interesting to note that he never says that one of his patient, one of his patients died. He said, "At plurus migrava." So, literally, he went over to the majority. And by the 18th century, the medicinal property of opium and laudanum were well known. So well known that the physician George Young recommended the drug for practically every ailment, including milk fever, rheumatism, thesis, toothache, internal inflammation, and even lowness of spirits. And similarly, his colleague, Edinburgh botanist Charles Olson hailed opium as doing more honor to medicine than any remedy whatsoever and recommended it for fluxes, hemorrhages, tenesmus, thinness, acrimony of the fluids, and etc. The difference between the two is that Charles Olson thought that opium was a divine remedy, full stop, whereas George Young sense that, was, that there was the possibility of abuse and so he, he acknowledges that opium can also be a poison. So when in 1656 Boyle and Wren injected a mixture of opium and alcohol into a vein of this dog, the animal fell into a state of stupor but after some time he spontaneously regained consciousness and eventually recovered fully. The dog's recovery provided the first proof of principle that it was possible to survive intravenous anesthesia. In other words, that it was possible to induce a total and reversible loss of consciousness by injecting an anesthetic into the bloodstream. So after Renz and Boyle's experiment on the dog, intravenous anesthesia was temporarily abandoned. It was apparently tried on a human subject, um, a, an unruly servant of an aristocrat. But as soon as the inject, uh, uh, injection was given, the man fell into stupor, and the master called off the experiment as it, he felt it was too dangerous. However, after barbiturates were discovered in the early 1900s, intravenous anesthesia was revived and developed into an established medical procedure. And today, anesthesia is widespread on a global scale. In the UK, the NHS alone performs about 3.5 million anesthetic procedures per year. And despite modern, anesthe uh, modern anesthesia has outgrown the direct use of opium, its derivatives, the derivatives of, of opium, remind us that it is still relevant to contemporary medicine. Morphine, for example, is still one of the most powerful pain killer available today, and heroin is still one of the most addictive narcotics used today. So if today we can have painless surgery and drug addiction, it is also thanks to the events that took place at 88 High Street in Deep Hall. Deep Hall was no longer extant. It was demolished um, in 1809. 
Turner's painting capture exactly the moment of its demolition. So the crowd gathered in front of the building are in fact masons at work demolishing Deep Hall. This painting therefore stands as a visual documentation of a no longer extant piece of architecture which hosted not only the experiments with the air pump as mentioned in the plaque on High Street but also a lesser known event in which a chemist slash surgeon, an architect slash astronomer slash physician, and a dog teamed up to produce the first successful intravenous anesthesia, a local event whose impact was global and still current. Of this, the plaque makes no mention. So my purpose today was to fill this gap. So the next time you walk past High Street, you know that there is more to it than the plaque says. And the next time you behold Turner's, Turner's High Street, which is now permanently housed here, here in the Ashmolean, third floor, you appreciate that its significance uh, lies not only in its being Turner's only full-size townscape in oils, but also in being a painting in which a slice of history of medicine converges with the history of art. Thank you.